Well, hello, my name is Dominic D'Andrea and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Queens Theatre and thank you, uh, Jay, for that um, amazing, uh, technically um, accomplished uh, introduction. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, hello to our live attendees here on the Zoom and to our storytellers this evening. And hello to those of you who are watching um, live on our Facebook stream. I'm seeing myself in my own glasses and I'm very low vision. So I'm gonna take my glasses off and hope that you can all see me. Um, so for the last two months, Queens Theater has been doing some pretty serious uh, deep dive into online and digital programming. We're rebranding that going forward as Queen's Theater at Home. And for the last six or eight weeks, we've been doing story circles Friday at 1 p.m. We have um, what we call QT Makes, which is a baking series with uh, whatever we have in our pantries and learning how to make different things. Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Uh, next Saturday night, uh, we are producing a Spanish language concert with artists, global artists around the world for our community in Queens, but anybody is welcome to join. And for the next month, we're like in the middle of this flow. Um, we have uh, brought back David Lawson, Queen storyteller extraordinaire, uh, to host his storytelling show on our digital platform. Now, for the, most of you know this, but Queen Storytellers was the first show live in our space that got canceled after um, the COVID stuff hit and we all had to go and uh, shelter in place. So it was a, a huge heartbreak for us. And we were so thrilled to be able to continue that work here on our digital spaces. And we're even more um, excited that um, there's such a community to join for this work and that there's a need and a hunger for it. And we just absolutely love this. So before we get going, I just wanna say, wherever you are tuning in from today. We hope that you are safe. We hope that you have uh, all the supplies that you need, that you're healthy, that you're happy, that your loved ones are. We recognize that this is the most difficult time many of us have faced in our lifetimes. And um, it's there's no easy answers to when this is going to end. So we just wanna take a moment to recognize you and thank you uh, for showing up to join us uh, this evening. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, David Lawson to the screen. David, hello. Hey, Dominic. Hello, everybody. All right, take it away. And welcome, everyone, to Queen Storytellers Online. I'm your host, David Lawson. It's great to be here on Zoom, or on Facebook Live, as it were, with all of you here tonight. We have some great performers for all you tonight, telling some great stories. And let's get right to it with our first performer tonight. She is the author of A Fish Out of Agua, available wherever you get books. And she is the host of the Fish Out of Agua podcast. All 101 episodes are available on iTunes. She's a regular performer on the very popular storytelling podcast, Risk, and she is a subject of If Knishes Could Talk, the definitive documentary on the New York accent. Our first performer, please welcome Michelle Carlo. Hi, everybody. Thanks, for, uh, Queens Theater, for letting this Brooklyn girl, that's where I live, tell a story. So when I was a kid growing up in the Bronx in the 1970s and early 80s, yes, that Bronx, there were kind of a few things that you had to look out for. Um, there were junkies that hung out in the schoolyards. There were dead dogs in the empty lots. There was broken glass everywhere. But the real danger, the real thing that you really had to worry about lurked behind the windows. Whether they were hiding behind a lace curtain or a half drawn Venetian blind or in a shadow with the only way you could know that they were there was the curl of uh, Virginia Slim or Paul Mall cigarette smoke. Yes, I'm talking about what passed then for a neighborhood block patrol, the watchers behind the windows, what my Italian friends used to call gomares, and what my Irish friends used to call effing busybodies. They were the elder ladies. They were the neighborhood's watch patrol 
whether they were hiding, whether they were visible, whether they were blatant with their bouffant wigs and, and their tight sweaters and their red lipstick and their dangling earrings, their function was to make sure that nothing went on on their little block, whatever they could see, that they didn't know about and could communicate to other people. For example, they knew uh, who walked their dog and who picked up after the dog and who didn't. They knew exactly what you bought in the supermarket. They knew what beer you bought. They knew if um, you were cheating on your spouse or your, or your girlfriend. They knew also which teenagers smoked cigarettes, which teenagers smoked weed, which teenagers drank beer, and which teenagers liked to make out with their enamorado of the moment in front of, a, in front of their window, which would be me. Yes, I hated them because they knew everything. And they told, they ratted. It was worse than one than um, surveillance, what, the, what they want to try to do now. Like, they told my father that I smoked cigarettes. They told my father I made out with boys. They told my father I, I, I drank this horrible wine called Boone's Farm. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I know, right? And like, I would get punished and I would pass by these windows again when, when I finished being grounded and I would be like, Why is, what's the matter with these old ladies? Do they have nothing better to do? And then you get older, you start not caring. It doesn't matter what you do because you're too old to be told on because you're not living at home anymore. And then I didn't give these um, gomades, these effing busybodies, these watchers behind the windows. I never gave them another thought until COVID-19. As the world shrank around us in the middle of March, it, it seemed to happen almost overnight, actually. Uh, the, um, at the end of February, I remember going with seven friends to the Apollo Theater to see a live movie screening of the movie Shaft with a, with a live accompaniment of a, a band called Burnt Sugar. And they were like thousands of people in the theater. And I remember hugging everybody and kissing everybody and hanging out in the crowded trains and everything. And it was great. And two weeks later, things started to close. Another couple of days later, people started working from home. The day after that, New York City went on pause. There's no place to go, nothing to do. If you, either you didn't have work or you had work from home, or you, but you had to stay home. And at first I was just like, oh, please, I'll get on the bus, I'll get on the subway. I, I brought stuff to my mom up in the Bronx. I went to different neighborhoods to Trader Joe's to buy food. But then as the report started coming in that more and more people were catching this and more and more people were dying, I started thinking, mm, maybe it's not such a good idea if, if I go out so much. So my world started shrinking only to where I could walk to and carry back from. No more buses, no more trains. And as the world started shrinking, more and more, I found myself for want of something better to do, looking out the windows. At first, I liked the back windows because I could see into people's backyards. I don't have a backyard. This is where the homeowners have, have their backyards. But there were trees. And as the trees started to sprout, I would notice that the squirrels and I would notice the birds. And I would, I would be able to see into the people's houses because you, you know, the trees hadn't covered everything yet. And I would see which father liked to dance with his wife, which person stayed alone drinking in front of their television, who was up in the window like practicing their dancing. It was kind of like rear window it was kind of cool but and then as the leaves started sprouting that view became obscured and the squirrels to be honest weren't cutting it for me anymore so I moved to the front window the street and I started noticing things I started noticing things like which neighbors picked up after their dogs and which didn't who wore a mask and who didn't whose kids had tantrums in the street and whose didn't? Where, who were people shopping at Trader Joe? Were people shopping at Fairway? Who was getting deliveries? 
Who was driving around? And I started becoming really interested about, um, you know, people, people's goings and comings and comings and goings. But then I started getting some freelance work. And then I was like, oh, I'm not worried about the window anymore. And then I would talk to my partner. Well, he's my boyfriend, but at my age, it's kind of weird to say boyfriend. But he's told me that he had started looking out his window too. He started, um, he made a little bird feeder. He was feeding squirrels. I was like, oh no, dude, you named this squirrel. You're done, you're done, you're done. Like, well, what are you? You're like an old man. You're like w w watching things out the window. And we laughed about it. But then one night there was a commotion out the window and I tried to go back to sleep, but there was yelling and, and there was screaming. And it sounded like somebody was walking up and down the block, breaking things. So I got a little concerned and I climbed out of bed and I walked into the, the next adjoining small room and I peeked behind the Venetian blinds and I saw a person walking up and down the block, banging on car, on, on car um, uh, the hoods, the hoods of cars. And I was like, oh my God, what is he doing? I mean, is, is he okay? I mean, is, is he, has he gone crazy? Is he looking for somebody? What's going on? So I call my boyfriend and um, I'm telling him that there's this commotion going on. He's like, well, did you call 911? I'm like, well, what am I gonna call 911 for? I was like, it's not my business. He's not, he's not hurting anybody. But then cop cars started coming. And then an ambulance came and, and then the EMTs came the, the fire truck EMTs came and, and I, they went down the block and I said to, to my boyfriend, I was like, I can't see what's going on and, and I'm gonna open the window. And he's like, no, don't stick your head out. Get a, just get, get a chair and like sit on it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I, I start looking out the window and he wants the play by play. So I'm like, well, the cops are talking to this guy. I can't really hear it. And you know, there was talking going on for a while. And then, you know, the cops started leaving. And then I was like, well, I kind of felt cheated. I was like, well, nobody's getting arrested. Nobody's getting put away. I mean, I guess it was okay. And then I laughed. I like, laughed at this, at the absurdity of all of this. And the, one of the cops looked up at the window where I was not hidden with the Venetian blind pulled up all the way. And I was like, and I just like ran, I like leaped back into bed. And I had this like hot flash of shame over me. And I pulled a quilt over me in like this unnecessary, unneeded, like useless way to hide myself even further. And that's when I realized, I, I knew, I knew that, oh my God, it took, almost 60 years and a pandemic for me to become the thing that I hated and feared when I was growing up. A gamare, an effing busybody, or what my grandmother would have called a presentao, a cuerpo ocupado, a, a, a titi beeja. I was one of them. And then I heard another commotion out the window and I was like, ah, whatever. And I went back to the window and I started looking out anyway. Oh, well, what you gonna do? He needs some entertainment, right? <laughs> Hey, thanks everybody. Michelle Carlo. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was terrific. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm appreciative to see anybody looking out their window and I've been doing plenty of it myself, but uh, when I'm walking outside in like the one hour a day, if that, that I'm not in this apartment, uh, the thing I'm so thankful to be seeing lately is not necessarily the people in the windows, but uh, anyone who has a dog or a cat staring, that thousand yard stare out the window. Folks, if you're watching this and you have a dog or a cat who's staring out the window, uh, thank you for your service or thank your dog or your cat for your service, really. Okay, let's keep the show moving. Our next performer is the host of the Playable Characters podcast, which has earned raves on the AV Club and Split Cider. Time Out New York recently ran an article of LGBTQ POC comedians that we are obsessed with right now. And our next performer was one of those comedians. Please welcome Calvin Cato. Hello, hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Um, so this story actually takes place in a uh, very early 2007. I had just graduated last year and I graduated in the middle of a Bush recession, basically. So we're talking pre Obama. We didn't have hope yet. No, we didn't. Yes, we could not. And so I graduated, um, with a degree in English and I had a short story collection that I was going to sell to random house. 
and Random House didn't know that they were gonna buy it, but I knew that they were gonna buy it. Um, as it turns out, sadly, they did not purchase it at all. And so I had to enter the working world and it was rough. Um, basically all I could find were temp jobs. There was nothing really available at the time. And so one of the first jobs I ever got was I had a job where I was working for Latina Magazine and I was working as a research assistant and my job was to help them craft articles about like different menus and different kinds of like Latinx foods that they wanted to feature in the magazine. And it was a great job. It paid $15 an hour, which at the time was very, very good. Um, it was certainly enough for me to eat with and at least buy a couple of 40s for the weekend to treat myself, you know, old English, cause I'm classy like that. And so I had this job, but it was a temporary job and it ran out. And so my friend just suggested this other temp agency, which we'll call Far Solutions. Uh, yes, that's the real name because they are a terrible temp agency. I would never recommend them to anybody. So I go to Far Solutions and I meet with a lady named Anna. Uh, Anna, also her real name. She's a terrible person and we will get to that in a second. So I go and I meet with Anna and Anna asks, you know, the typical questions. Um, if you've never been to a temp agency, basically the, what you're expected to do is you take a typing test, they test you on how good you are at Word and Excel and PowerPoint, and then you come in for an interview where they ask you, the, what are your skill sets? And after they ask you about your skill sets, then they say, okay, um, what's your rate that you want? And then we go from there. So I take the test, I do pretty well. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I'm pretty good at Microsoft Word, okay? <laughs> I know how to copy and paste and cut and paste, and I can do both of those things very properly. So I take the test, I talk to her and she asks, Calvin, so like, what's your rate that you want? And I said, well, at my last job, I was making $15 an hour. And then she says, okay, that sounds good. Um, I think you should start at $11 an hour. And here's the thing. I know I was an English major, but I also know math. And I know that $11 is less than $15. So I ask, I said, well, that seems a little weird. Um, I was making $15, why would I make $11 an hour? And this is when Anna switches from a very, being a very nice, helpful um, temp person to a very mean and condescending temp person. She basically says, you know, I don't understand why you think that you are valued at that much right now. You understand that you're gonna be lucky enough to get a job and this is a great $11 an hour job and it's gonna be a good stepping point. And because I was so paranoid and worried about everything, I decided, you know what, maybe you're right. I will take this $11 an hour job. And so the job is I am in a back room of, of, of an office, just back room where all the mail is sorted and I have to stuff envelopes. And that's what I do for an entire day. Um, I don't know if you can tell, it's very unfulfilling and it's also very rough on the hands. A lot of paper cuts, it was not a cute look. I do the job for the day, I finish, I call Anna and I said, hey, listen, I finished this job. Um, do you have anything else? And she says, okay, just stay by the phone and I will try to find something else for you. So she decides to call my cell phone, but this is back when um, basically there was no service underground and I was on a train. She calls, I miss the call. And then I, when I emerge out of the train station and have service again, I have three missed calls from her going, I don't understand. I thought you wanted to work. Why don't you ever answer my calls? Very type A, very needy. I call her back and I ask her what the job is. And she goes, you should be excited, Calvin, because this job is going to pay $12 an hour. And in my head, I'm still like, well, again, I'm an English major, but 12 is still less than 15. So I'm not really sure where this is going, but okay, uh, you know what? I'll take this job. Um, this job was not involving me stuffing envelopes, but I was still in a back room. And this time I was sorting files for a bank. Um, and this was a, one of the smaller credit banks. And it was very sketchy because the bank needed all of these files sorted because they were undergoing an audit. And I will be honest, after I finished the job, I never heard from this bank again. Don't know what happened to it. Maybe everyone's in federal prison, no idea. Didn't really care, didn't wanna ask questions. I just wanted to make $12 an hour. So I'm in this back room, I'm stuffing envelopes and it's very just, I'm in this back room, sorry, I'm in this back room, I'm filing, I'm filing all these things, I'm sorting through all, everything. And it's very just demoralizing and depressing. And so I just, I started talking to a couple of my other friends who had just graduated just to like get their take on things. And they're both not doing much better than me in the real world. 
um, one of my friends was also temping in an office and there was another friend and his job was um, basically to be an extra. So I don't know if you remember, there's a series on MTV called um, MTV's Yo Mama, where people would go back and forth and tell Yo Mama jokes. And the person who told the best Yo Mama joke moved forward. So basically, whenever people would tell the joke, they would say, da 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 da, Yo Mama, so da 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 da, da 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 da. And then you'd hear someone go, oh. And that was my friend's job. My friend's job was to go, oh. So as you can see, that's not exactly, you know, what you want to, like, you know, obviously, like, you know, this isn't where Rob, Robin Williams got to start. Robin Williams wasn't going, oh, and then moved on to Patch Adams. That's just not a thing. So what we did was um, we were like, listen, we just need to get out of our jobs and do something more worthwhile. So we decided to go on Craigslist. This was back when Craigslist was safe and not, you know, basically a death sentence if you went on there and posted something. We went on Craigslist and we found a posting that a game show was looking for a team of three people to be on the show. And I was like, hey, let's do this. And my friend was like, yeah, let's go in and audition for the show. So we go into the audition, we audition for the show. And at first, like, I, we think that we're, things are going okay, but we think that this is getting pretty bland and they may not pick us until they ask, um, hey, do you guys have an interesting story? So um, I don't know if you're familiar with game shows, but for example, with Jeopardy, if you've ever seen Jeopardy, um, in the middle of the first round, you know, Alex Trebek goes down and asks, people, you know, for like an interesting anecdote or an interesting story so that Alex and that contestant can banter. So one of the things that I had mentioned was I said, oh, you know, we all went to a naked party once, which piqued the producer's interest. And here's the thing is that it wasn't an orgy. I just want to make it very clear. No sex happened. Nothing happened at all. We literally just went to a party where we all had to be naked. The band had to be naked. The band was naked. And we just like sat around naked, listened to music and like occasionally body painted ourselves. But the producer was like, ooh, three guys who met at a naked party. This is going to be interesting. So because of that, we ended up getting cast on the show. And we were very excited. This is going to be super fun and really amazing. Um, and we, but unlike all the other people who were like, oh, we want to do this as a springboard. I did want it as a TV springboard, but I also really wanted the money, as did my friends. So what we did was we, VC, we had a VCR. I don't know if you remember those things. We taped every single episode of, of that game show, the show was called Chain Reaction. We taped every single episode and we would, after work every day, we would go to one of our respective places. We would sit, we would practice. We would like quiz each other on how the show rules went. We would go through it. Like we were like, we're gonna be on point so that we can come in and we can win all this money. It's gonna be great. So we're practicing at night, we're working by day or rather my friend is going, oh, by day. And then it's the day before the show tapes. And the day before the show tapes, I come into the bank and I sit and I do nothing. I do absolutely nothing. Uh, pe the people are like asking me, hey, are you gonna work today or do something? I said, no, I don't have to work today. I'm gonna be on television tomorrow. I'm quitting this job. I call Anna and I tell Anna, listen, to be honest, this didn't work for me and I'm gonna be on television tomorrow. And I just really don't need this job. And Anna goes, you can't just quit. What are we gonna do? How am I gonna replace you? You understand that this is not a professional thing to do at all. And I just did not care. I said, you know what? I really don't care. This is just not my problem right now. I'm gonna be on television and I don't need this anymore. I don't need this $12 an hour job. This is nonsense to me. And then I hang up and I leave. I get all of my stuff that day and I quit. So the next day I come in for the show taping. And I come in, I'm dressed very nicely. I'm dressed in this, well, this something similar to this. I want to look classy. It's going to be my first time like on camera. And they do the hair, they do the makeup and we get on that stage and the show is going to be guys versus girls. And we get on the show and I'm like, oh my God, this is actually happening. You know, we talk to the host. We have great banter about the naked party thing. It's going really well. And we win. In fact, we win over $8,000. It was amazing. The other team didn't even score a single point. They scored nothing. We won. We got to the final round. We won the final round. We won bonus money. It was amazing. I was so happy. And I thought, this is, it's all coming together. I'm going to have this money and it's going to be really great. And this is going to be, I'm going to be on television and this is going to be great too. And so I get to the point where we have to sign the contract because when you win the money, you have to sign a contract and a whole slew of releases. 
And so when I saw it, I said, oh, okay, so where's the check for the money? And that's when the producers go, well, you actually don't get the money until six months after the show airs. And now I'm like, oh no, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't plan for this. I didn't know what to do. So then cut to the next day. And the next day I call Anna back and I said, Hey girl. So remember how I basically said I was quitting and I basically told you to go F yourself. <laughs> I was totally kidding. I was totally kidding. Do you, do you think I could maybe get the, get a job back or something? <laughs> And Anna goes, you know what? We'll call you and then hangs up on me. So now I'm in a huge, huge conundrum. Luckily though, the nice temp agency did manage to get back in touch with me and they managed to get me a really nice job working at an art gallery until the check came in the mail. Super happy, very relieved. And if you learn nothing else from this, the moral of the story is make sure that you never quit your day job. Don't quit your day job. Um, this has been my time, and thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you. Calvin Cato! Ah, oh, that was fantastic for so many reasons, one of which is, you know, we're all thinking lately about the places we miss, uh, the restaurants, the bars, our friends, our loved ones' places, but uh, the second that Calvin mentioned a temp agency, I was like, oh, that's... Uh, that's a place I don't miss going. And I can't be the only one who watched that. It was like, oh yeah, there's some places I really don't miss. I was raised in a pretty observantly Jewish household, which meant come Christmas time, no tree, no stockings, no lights, no gifts, nothing. My girlfriend Paige also grew up Jewish and the two of us, we have worked in tourism. Uh, for quite some time, which means that our December 25ths involve waking up, going to work, and then coming back home and fulfilling the stereotype of, yes, Chinese food and a movie, which, by the way, uh, there are few things in New York City that make me joyously say only in New York, like being at a halal Chinese food restaurant here in Astoria, Queens, where I've lived for over 10 years now and seen all the cultures gloriously mixing together on Christmas night. And just this past December 25th, we went to work and we came home, we got our food and we're at home and we're watching a Christmas story because I didn't grow up with Christmas, but come on, I mean, a Christmas story, that's great for so many other reasons. I mean, you know, confronting the bully and then breaking down in tears, like I, I've been there. I can relate with that one. We're watching the movie and Paige and I, we have two roommates and one in particular uh, always enters downstairs coming to our building. He always opens the door really loudly. You can hear it from upstairs, me, he's coming home. We're watching the movie and we hear that sound downstairs, although, Immediately, I realized that there's something a little off about the sound. It sounds just uh, a little different. And we hear footsteps coming up the stairs, but we don't hear footsteps getting out the key and opening up the door to come home. We hear those footsteps walking around in the hallway just outside of our room. And then those footsteps walk back down the stairs. And we pause the movie because this is kind of weird. And Paige and I, we get up, we open the door to our apartment unit, and we see that the bicycle that our roommate owned isn't there. Uh, the bicycle, I should mention, that in the five years it's been in the hallway, he has touched that bicycle this many times. Paige and I, we walk downstairs and we see that the second door to our building, not the front door, the one after it, the second door to our building is completely ripped off the hinges. Somebody broke into our building. The first thought that I had 
seeing that busted door was. You know, if we had just started a Christmas story 30 minutes later, then we could have been watching the scene where Ralphie has his home broken into by robbers as our home was being broken into by a robber. That was my first thought. And our roommate whose bicycle it was, was out of town and we gave him a call and he was rattled, but he was okay. And we knocked on our other roommate's door and we told them what happened, also rattled, but it was okay. We all have a good relationship, the four of us here. Paige and I go downstairs to our downstairs neighbor who we are on a uh, first name basis with. In fact, we've been over there uh, on Christmas night in years past, our neighbor, Willie. And we knock on Willie's door and he comes to the door kind of sleepy looking in pajamas. Uh, he was asleep. He slept through the whole thing, which to me, the fact that he slept through that rather unusual door opening, door breaking really means that our roommate really must come home loud a lot if he's like completely used to that. And the very next morning, the morning of December 26th, mind you, uh, our superintendent, George, he shows right up and he fixes the door right away. And right after George comes our 80 something year old landlord, Sophia. And she's showing up. She's not just checking in on the property that she owns. She is checking in on us. And that was a bad thing that happened. That was, was bad news. Yeah, they didn't get actually into this apartment unit, but they got into our building. They stole something of our roommates, but more than that being something bad, it was the type of something bad that made me realize some good things, like that it's good to be on good terms with your roommates, to have a friendship and a camaraderie. It's, it's good to be on a first name basis, to go over for Christmas dinner to your downstairs neighbor. It's good to be on good terms with your superintendent and heck yeah, even with your landlord. Because when bad things happen to you or when bad things happen to them, if you have those good terms, then there's some support there. On December 26th last year, excuse me, December 27th last year, uh, I went back to my hometown of Annandale, Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC, where I grew up. I was going there to spend Hanukkah with my mother and my father, and I went with my girlfriend, Paige. And um, I kind of screwed something up on that visit. What I screwed up is how I told them the story that I just told you lovely people watching tonight. Because here's what I said. Um, I said, uh, Mom... Dad, it's the holiday season, and uh, Paige and I, and I see my parents' faces, like their eyes are widening. They got this glow to them. They're like, oh my goodness, we never thought that we would live to see this moment in the life of our little baby boy, David. I say, uh, well, mom and dad, after eight years of dating and five years of living together, Paige and I had our building broken into. And I see my mother and my father lit up by those Hanukkah candles, <laughs> deflate like birthday party balloons. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. All right. Let's keep this show moving right along. Our next performer has performed at Joe's Pub at the legendary public theater with her sketch comedy group, Asian Pop. She is a founder of the Asian American Film Thing, an organization that supports Asian American filmmakers and the stories that they tell. And just about two weeks ago, New York Magazine ran this article, a retrospective of UCB New York. And they mentioned 20 of the funniest things 
that New York Magazine had ever seen on stage at UCB. And one of those funny things was a performance by our next performer. Folks, please welcome Angel Yao. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, so it was the first time I was at a doctor's checkup all by myself. I was 17. Um, I've gone through it, you know, a million times with my parents, but this time it's me signing my own name on the clipboard. Um, and then they gave me a bunch of forms to fill and I was like, great, I can do it, I can do it. And then I was like, no, I can't. What's my social security number? What's a social security number? Uh, maybe I'll just put zero and move on. We'll see what happens. Um, and then I went through more pages and then uh, there was another form and I was like, hmm, this looks new. And I'm reading it and it's like, how well do you sleep? How high is your anxiety? Do you get nervous all the time? And then I was like, oh, ooh, this, is, this is one of those like depression tests. And I got really excited because um, I always wanted to talk about this. Um, you know, I, I checked high for almost all of the questions. And I'm like, I, I think I have, you know, like I, I feel all these things, um, but maybe I'm overreacting. I don't know. Um, I'm just glad that I'm able to fill this out and then talk to an actual doctor about it. Um, so once they called my name, I went into the checkup and they did the usual, you know, like uh, my height, my weight, heartbeat, the arm pulse thingy, the ear tickle thingy, um, aim your pee in a cup thingy. Um, and then after all that, uh, the fi finally the doctor looked over um, the depression thingy and he was like, hmm, you don't have this, right? You, you don't have it. Everyone's stressed all the time. Uh, we all have sleepless nights sometimes. And he just kind of brushed it off. And right away in my head, I was like, Dr. Chang's right. He's right. I don't have this. Uh, whatever I'm going through is normal. Everyone goes through it. Okay, um, so quickly, I just uh, wanted to sh sh share like kind of a slideshow um, of like, uh, is this normal or not? Um, so just really quickly. Um, so yeah, here are all the uh, pictures of me going like, is this normal or not? Um, I guess, you know, just shout out or like uh, put yes or no on a chat. Um, so first thing is um, I bite my nails a lot. Um, it's even worse now, like my nails are really, really bad. Um, normal or not, or relatable at least. Um, okay, it looks like, you know, some of you. Um, next, I, I hoard a lot of clothes and just anything. Um, I still have like a shirt from elementary school uh, where I'm like, it, you know, if I work out more, I could probably fit in it, so let's not throw it away. Uh, anyone can relate to that? Okay, I see some some people, okay. Um, I love a hot buffet, um, but I, I'm so indecisive that um, right, uh, what you see right here is like a corner of a lasagna, uh, some guacamole next to it with mashed potatoes, three chicken wings and three broccoli for health. Um, so, you know, that's a meal and that's normal to me. Um, a lot of times, uh, I would uh, G chat search, uh, I love you, and kind of like uh, read it over before I go to bed to ensure that people do love me. Um, do you other people, do you guys do that? Okay. Uh, I wrote that my best friend was myself in junior high school because I felt like I didn't have any best friends anyone can relate. Okay. Um, I, I think the last book I read was a Goosebump book. Anyone, anyone can relate. Um, and um, I remember this happening, um, you know, how like I live in uh, Queens in New York City and there's always uh, subway problems. And, um, you know, this was when the subway uh, stopped completely. And um, I was like, okay, should I, should I keep waiting? Or should I walk to another train station or to like another stop or just like a whole other train station and take that train? Um, or should I just cab it? And then I'm like, what, what if the train comes while 
I'm getting the cat, like then, you know, then I'm wasting my time. Um, but if, if I get the cat, maybe it, what if it's the same time, like, because it costs so much money to take a cab, I really just want to get to a place, like, my main thing is getting to a place on time, um, and then I started to kind of, like, cry, because I, I know, like, as, you know, as I'm thinking about this, I am wasting time, and I need to make, like, a right and efficient decision quickly, otherwise I'm a failure, um, and so scenarios like that happens a lot. Um, I just, I feel like I need to make a quick decision and I just can't because I'm like trying to weigh it all out, but nothing seems to be uh, right um, that comes out. So I go through that a lot. And then it made me think um, if something as simple as this causes me to break down, um, you know, how am I going to start a family or prioritize my dream job and my uh, regular job or how am I going to kind of truly be happy? Um, so 14 years after that initial doctor visit, I decided to find a therapist. Um, and then I got anxiety about finding a therapist. I was pretty much the same thing with the train. I was like, uh, you know, like the money thing, like what if it's the wrong therapist? Like, do I need like a, a woman therapist or a man? Like, should it be the same? And then, um, so two years after that, I finally made a decision to like, let's just find a therapist. Um, and um, I decided that my priority was to find an Asian American. Um, so they have the same, they understand like uh, my views of culture and racism and all of that. And a, a woman, um, same thing if they understand, uh, you know, what my point of view is and someone near my neighborhood so I could kind of go in there um, without having a breakdown about trains. Um, so I, you know, like I was looking for an Asian therapist near in my neighborhood and um, there was just one. So it was really easy, easy. I was like, well, okay, that's the one I'll take. Um, shortly after uh, that meeting with the therapist, uh, we talked about, you know, like my childhood, uh, parents, immediate tears, tears, tears. And then we also decided that maybe uh, we should take, um, that I should take a psychological test as well. Um, so we scheduled for that. And um, first off, uh, when I went there, it was like all children and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, we did a bunch of testing. It was like memorization tests, draw these patterns this way, uh, reaction time test. Uh, reading tests and I'm like, am I like, am I taking the SATs? What is this? It was so stressful. Um, There's like a word test and um, one of, I remember one of the words was like, give me one word that um, describes door. And then I was just like, wait, what? Door? Like how, one word? Like I, <laughs> it was like, what? Um, it just felt like an IQ test rather than like a psychological test. Um, and then uh, after that, it was a bunch of rate one to 10 on how you feel kind of tests. And my thoughts were going again. I was like, you know, like the question was about how productive do you feel? And I'm like, I know I feel not productive 80% of the time, but is that really true? Like, I know I'm, you know, really negative. So who am I to judge if I'm productive or not? Um, like, what do I know? Isn't that like bias? I'm like bias against my negativity. Shouldn't someone just like examine me from an outside view? Um, so I kept thinking that I was like, am I doing this test wrong? Um, and you know, remember when uh, when you like take your essay test in uh, high school or elementary school and you're, you'll write like SSS, which means like, sorry, so sloppy, just like a little message to the teacher. Um, and I kind of wrote that on a test. I'm like, um, I think I'm wrong, you know, like just letting you know, like, I don't know if I need to uh, do something else. Um, and um, is that, okay. Uh, I was like, is that relatable? I don't know. I, I'll add it to the unrelatable list. Um, and it also took me two days to take the test. Usually it takes uh, people one day, but I was like, you know, it's fine. Um, and I did get my results and I'm gonna share it with you uh, because this is I'm, this is a safe space, I assume. Um, and I'm sure you're curious, like, what does she have? Uh, so uh, let's see, I, uh, there it goes. Um, so that's the test, those are all the tests I took. 
Um, this is just a summary. And so pretty much I do have anxiety disorder. I'm sure you notice I have OCD, uh, bipolar, mild, and I can't read pretty much, but we don't have to talk about that. Um, so just uh, some stats um, I wanted to share that one in every five adults do uh, experience mental illness and uh, one in 25 uh, live with their mental illness daily. And then a lot of it, it begins um, at a certain age. And also um, Asian Americans are three times less likely to seek mental health services uh, than other Americans. Um, so I always kind of ask myself, uh, you know, will I ever be happy? Um, is it me? Like, is this how I was born and that's just the way I am? Or is it my parents? Um, as you can see, I love that green boss more than my parents. Just kidding, I love my parents. Um, but like, you know, that's how they brought me up and that's what I've learned. So is it like my family or is it the Asian culture, the Asian American culture where uh, mental health isn't a real thing? You know, we don't really talk about it. Um, a lot of times it's belief. It's like you can control it yourself. It's it's nothing that we need to seek help for. Um, so I went, so currently I still, I'm still seeing my therapist um, and I'm still working out uh, things that make me feel negative and uh, the OCD thing. And um, this past week, I actually chatted with my parents um, over video chat. And I kind of wanted to reveal this, like tell them my journey um, because we haven't really talked about this. It was kind of a secret um, that I held onto. Um, so we were talking, you know, we talked about careers and babies and, and then something you know, like happiness, what it means to them. And it seemed like they agreed with most of the things that, you know, mental health is real. And um, they do believe um, it's not like, it can't be too controlled with your brain. You know, it's like a thing that uh, people need to uh, work on. Um, but then they're like, uh, but you know, like we're not crazy. You're not crazy, right? And right at that moment, I was like, they're right, they're right, they're right. I, you know, you know, we're not crazy. I'm not crazy. Just, just have a little OCD, which is, which is normal. Um, so uh, that's my story. And um, I just wanted to, if you can't tell, May is Asian American Heritage Month and it's also Mental Health Awareness Month. And so that's why I wanted to share that with you all. Thank you so much. Angel Yao, thank you, Angel. Oh, oh absolutely. I, I, I was relating to almost all of that. Uh, in fact, these days, uh, the two in particular, that the buffet indecision anxiety has become just a crippling Netflix anxiety. Uh, you know, that's been my nights. And even more so than that, if you, if you can't relate to that one, and I think I did see some people out there relating to that one, the one that I think we can all relate to uh, that Angel just mentioned is, um, am I taking this test right? That is a sentence that I think oh, just strongly applies to the last seven, eight, nine, what, whatever week we're on, am I taking this test right? Our final performer this evening, and I should mention, by the way, that if you did have a good time tonight, uh, go online, shout it out, tweet it out, Instagram it out, uh, whatever uh, you do on Snapchat, do that too, because uh, we're going to be back here both next Friday and the Friday after at 730. We have two more Queen Storytellers online shows scheduled after this one, but our final performer for this week is a six-time The Moth Story Slam winner. He has been heard on The Moth Radio Hour, and he was recently featured on PBS's storytelling show, Stories from the Stage. Please welcome Richard Cardillo. Hello. Thank you so much, David. Thank you to Queens Theater, and thank you for everybody in the audience for joining us tonight. What a fantastic way to keep in touch. It's 1990, and after 14 years, Brother Mark is still alive 
and well and doing great works in the world, thinking he was going to save the world. And I wanted to annihilate him. In 1976, I was so afraid of being gay. I was in a Italian American Catholic family and being gay was not an option. So I went the holy route to pray away the gay. And at the age of 17, I made the profound decision to join a monastery. And within a short time of joining that monastery, they changed my name to Brother Mark. I used to think at the beginning that they changed that name so that you could show that you had a new life, you were born again. But I learned only later on in my life that the reason you change your name is so that decades later, you could start seeing therapist after therapist complaining about identity issues. It just wouldn't go away for me. I went through all the motions. I go through the formation. I go out teaching. And I know I'm not really living my authentic life. So I asked for harder and harder work. Finally, the brothers assigned me to the mission schools in Lima, Peru where I was going to work in shanty towns. And again, I'm going through the motions. I know I'm not living my authentic life and I'm having urges all over the place, but I knew I was not gonna act on any one of those urges as long as I had this vow of celibacy. I wasn't gonna go back on that promise. I kept channeling the words of Horton, not the saint, the elephant. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. Brother Mark will be faithful 100%, and I just wanted out. I wanted to live. Finally, I had this mantra every morning. I'd wake up and say, not another day of Brother Mark. Not another day of Brother Mark living a lie. Not another day of Brother Mark not being authentic. Not another day of Brother Mark. I screwed up my courage, and I finally made the decision to write to Rome and get dispensed from my vows and live outside the monastery. The brothers quickly bought me a one-way ticket back, and they also gave me a new suit and $450. And that's it. I mean, I kept thinking, even Maria Von Trapp got the goddamn the, the guitar out of her deal. What was this all about? But I went back on that plane, settled in New York City, found a sublet studio apartment on the Lower East Side and went looking for church. Uh, for work, and I kept coming up short. I couldn't get work. Finally, a nibble. There was this Boston based educational nonprofit that was looking for a regional director because they were coming to New York. So I went and I interview interviewed for the job, and I did pretty well. It gets right to the end, and the president of the company calls me up to Boston one more time. And I take the train up and I sit in his office, and he says, Well, now it's down to crunch time. We're down to two candidates only, you and another candidate. And that other candidate is a woman. 80% of the schools in New York City have principals that are women. We are looking at a woman to fill this position. And Richard, you are not a woman. And I thought, damn, I didn't get the job. I didn't get it. I knew my male privilege had gotten me further than I ever expected to get in my life, but the buck stopped here. I wasn't gonna get it. So I figured go out with a smile, maybe a laugh, a little bit of frivolity, get back on that bus, back to New York City. And I looked at him and when he said to me, Richard, you are not a woman. I looked back at him and I said, well, not by day. And I got the job. I got the job. I was hired. The next few days were a whirlwind. He kept taking me around, introducing me to the board members, to people from the New York City Department of Ed. And he kept saying, and here's Richard Cardillo. He's an out and proud gay man. And by night, he does drag. He thought I was a drag queen. Well, this took on a life of its own. He was going out and telling everybody, yeah, we have now somebody who does drag, it's great. At the end of that month, he wanted to invite me out for a real big celebratory lunch. And he invited me to a really ritzy restaurant in New York City. I meet him there for lunch, <coughs> excuse me. And he still had this inordinate fascination with this 
drag part of me, which didn't really exist. <coughs> Excuse me. And he started asking me questions. He said, so Rich, when you do this drag, do you wear like dresses and wigs? I said, oh yeah, a lot of dresses and wigs. He said, well, where do you do this? I said, well, here and there in the East Village. He said, do you wear makeup? I said, oh yeah, a whole lot of makeup. <coughs> <clears throat> oh, sorry, just for one second. Perfect. I said, yeah, a whole lot of makeup. And then he said, well, what's your drag name? And I thought, shit, I don't have a drag name. What am I going to do? That morning, I had just been cleared at a local clinic in the East Village where I went to take care of all of my anti-malarial medicines. It was my first stateside checkup. And they did the battery of tests for me. And I'm nervous as can be. I still have the lab report testing in my hands. I still have the little bracelet on my arm. And I said, my drag name, my drag name, I'm, I'm Beth Israel. I'm Beth Israel. And Beth Israel was born. Well, now it just got out of control. He starts going around telling everybody, we have Richard Cardillo, a.k.a. Beth Israel, who's going to do a great big drag fundraiser for us, and it's going to be fabulous. And I thought, wait a second, just a few short months before, I was a vowed man with a vow of celibacy at a monastery. I come to New York as an out and, gay, out and proud gay man. Then all of a sudden, I'm a drag queen. I just didn't want to know where that next step was going to lead me. But I did come to the realization that not another day, Brother Mark had been annihilated at the beautifully manicured hands of not by day, Beth Israel. I'd like to believe that I didn't have to annihilate Brother Mark. There are parts of Brother Mark that are still alive in me today that I love, my love of humanity, my love of people, my sense of social justice in the world. I wanna keep that alive. But now I make sure I leave a little corner of my psyche reserved for that beautiful, witty, and charming Beth Israel. But not by day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Richard Cardillo. <laughs> All right. Ah, oh, the hair flip was perfect. Ah, oh, folks, it was good in rehearsal, but that was really something, something nice there. And a little tip of the cap to all those folks uh, working hard, saving lives at Beth Israel off First Avenue in the Lower East Side. All right, folks, uh, before we end this, I'm uh, going to do a little bit of a curtain call. But first, I just want to say a huge thank you to Jay Rogers, the general manager at the Queens Theater, who has been our lovely stage manager tonight. Dominic D'Andrea, who has been just so fantastic getting all this online programming together. But let's bring out our performers and you can feel free to clap at home in this card and call folks let's hear it for michelle carlo calvin cato Hi. angel yow <laughs> and richard cardillo <laughs> and i have been your host david lawson you have all been so fantastic. We're going to be right back here next Friday at 7.30. Thank you all so much. Thank you to these four great performers. And we will see you back here next Friday, 7.30. This has been Queen Storytellers Online. I'm David Lawson. Good night. Thank Good you night. so much. Take care. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Good night. <laughs>